Japan, 1604. After a civil war that lasted for more than a century, legendary shogun Ieyasu Tokugawa did the impossible by uniting a country that seemed like it would be stuck in conflict for eternity. This unification was supposed to bring with it a new age of peace for the approximately 20 million people that lived on the country's countless islands at the time. A goal which was, for the most part, achieved successfully. This peace, however, brought unemployment to nearly half a million soldiers, whose livelihood depended on their country's seemingly endless hunger for war and conflict. These soldiers were, of course, called samurai. With their beloved homeland at peace, they had to find different ways of bringing food to the table, some of them becoming merchants, bureaucrats, or even scholars. But not all of these battle-hardened warriors were ready to accept a peaceful life off the battlefield, which led them to pursue a lifestyle that more closely resembled their behavior pre-unification. Robbing, stealing, and murdering became their new livelihood, which in the public's eye turned them from strong, respected warriors into dreadful enemies of the people. What these ex-samurai did not know at the time was that through their actions, they would create an opposition group that was destined to become the precursor of modern Japan's highly influential crime syndicates. These syndicates would become so influential, in fact, they would go on to become deeply involved in their nation's politics, accumulate immeasurable fortunes, and even plunged their own country into World War II. These are the origins and early history of the Yakuza. When you think of modern Yakuza members, you think of expensive suits, gold chains, and of course, those highly elaborate tattoos covering their bodies. Therefore, it is interesting to note that even more than 400 years ago, some of these flashy fashion choices existed within a group closely related to the Japanese Mafia's history. The aforementioned unemployed samurai, also known as Ronin, started to form groups which carried the name Hatamoto Yako, meaning bannermen. Alternatively, the name Kabukimono, roughly translated as crazy ones, became more and more common. So what exactly earned them this nickname? These jobless samurai truly lived their new outlaw lifestyle, carrying extraordinarily long swords and wearing colorful clothing. Back then, bright colors and patterns were not a popular choice, especially for samurai, as it was considered to be immodest. If you think that a colorful samurai is ahead of his time, you'll be even more impressed to hear that they were occasionally spotted wearing women's clothing as well. A regular kimono isn't that far off from a woman's dress anyway. Besides outlandish fashion choices, use of violence and intimidation is another characteristic that Yakuza are often connected with. They are gangsters, after all. The kabukimono, or crazy ones, were certainly not lacking in this department either. To give you an idea of how unhinged some of these ronin were, let me tell you about a disgusting practice called tsuchigiri, or crossroads killing, which was quite common among these ronin groups. Sometimes random pedestrians on the road could literally lose their head if they are unlucky to pass by a kabukimono. Asking the perpetrator, they will tell you it was only done in order to test the sharpness of their blade. I don't know about you, but I call bullshit on that one. Hearing about something as cruel as Tsuchigiri makes the formation of certain resistance groups all the more relatable. Theft and pretty much all other forms of crime were also included on the list of harmful activities that the Kabukimono took part in. And following such a long period of civil war, Common citizens of Japan were especially tired of all the violence. After all, they were supposed to enjoy an age of peace. Enter the Machiyako, the servants of the town. 
These groups, who aimed to protect the common folk against the crazy ones, were mainly composed of peasants, farmers, and merchants. In some rare cases, ex-samurai who were embarrassed by their former colleagues' behavior joined the good fight, bringing something very valuable into combat. Swords. With a few exceptions, most social classes in 17th century Japan were not allowed to carry a sword. Merchants, for example, were pretty lucky to be allowed a short sword, not dissimilar to the ones that samurai liked to carry next to their big katana. Other classes were restricted to using farming tools to defend themselves, which could certainly knock a guy out. However, if you find yourself up against one of those masterfully crafted katana that samurai had at their disposal, the effectiveness of a simple stone axe diminishes quite a bit. The Machiako were obviously true crowd favorites, earning a reputation among citizens as protectors of the people. Funnily enough, if you ask a modern Yakuza to which group their roots trace back to, they will proudly proclaim to be descendants of the Machiako, not the Kabukimono. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, with Yakuza clearly showcasing characteristics of both the unhinged, violent Kabukimono as well as the chivalrous servants of the common man, the Machiako. A clear-cut connection to any of the groups cannot be made, though, with both groups eradicated by the government towards the end of the century. While legends and folk tales of the competing Yaku groups, which were now defunct, would keep spreading across Japan well into the 17th century, the country would soon see the birth of two new groups, who would ultimately transform into the modern Japanese crime syndicates that we all know today. These two groups emerged in the mid-18th century and were called Tekia, the Peddlers, and Bakuto, the Gamblers. Here, the connection to today's Japanese Mafia starts to become more clear. Even three centuries later, with the Yakuza having its hand in many different types of businesses like drugs and prostitution, both market stands as well as gambling are still integral parts of the crime syndicate's money-making machine. Just how huge the influence of gambling on the Yakuza really is becomes apparent by simply looking at the origin of their name. In Japan, Hanafuda cards became all the rage starting in the 16th century. Naturally, a lot of different ways to play with them emerged, one of them actually being pretty similar to blackjack. You get three cards, then the values of the player's cards are added up, with the total's last digit deciding who wins. A variation of the worst possible hand in a game is 8 plus 9 plus 3, which equals 20, meaning your hand is zero. In Japanese, 893 can be read as ya. Yakuza. Yakuza. Gambling groups started using this word themselves in order to describe something as useless. With time, the term started to see widespread use when describing any kind of criminal, since social outcasts and gangsters were considered useless. The similarities between the Yakuza and the Tekia or Bakudo groups are not limited to ways of making money, though. Both of them mastered something that the Yaku groups severely lacked, a high degree of organization, with rivaling gamblers and peddlers sticking to a designated area controlled by their group. You can imagine that a lack of annoying distractions like fights and other conflicts improved business quite a bit for everyone involved. Another similarity to the current Japanese Mafia are the backgrounds of both Tekia and Bakudo group members. Penniless, homeless, lawless, all of those who didn't find a place in Japan's highly structured, hierarchical culture found a place in these groups, making recruitment a walk in the park. Speaking of recruitment and hierarchy, who exactly was it that gave these misfits a home and a family to call their own? The use of the word family was not mere hyperbole on my part. Instead, it is the most accurate way to describe the hierarchy and relationships that Yakuza gangs have followed for the past 250 plus years, which is referred to as Oyabun Kobun. Oyabun and Kobun can be translated as father role and child role. When recruiting a new member, the boss, or Oyabun, takes the father role, providing those of lower rank, the Kobun, work, protection, as well as advice. A tradition in which both the Oyabun and the Kobun drink sake together makes the whole thing official. 
Many of you might recognize this type of ceremony from movies or video games. Oyabun Kobun is a type of relationship that, even today, can be found everywhere in Japan, though sometimes under different names like Senpai Kohai. Family, workplaces, and of course crime groups all demand a certain degree of loyalty, respect, and hierarchy in order to work properly, which is why this system proved to be a big part of what made the Yakuza so powerful, especially in the early days. Bringing together a group of delinquents can easily end up to be a mess, unless you give them something of value, something to lose, something they did not have before, a sense of belonging and a family that is ready to fight and die for each other. Without such a meticulous structure in place, it is doubtful that the Yakuza would have survived for as long as they did. A century went by, but the Yakuza were here to stay. The mid-1800s had arrived, and with it a lot of change for the country of Japan as a whole. 220 years earlier, in 1633, a foreign policy called Sakoku had been installed by the shogunate government, led by Tokugawa Iemitsu. With this policy in place, travel from and to Japan was basically illegal, and even trade was incredibly limited. Sakoku was put in place mainly because foreign influence and religion was viewed as a big threat to national safety and stability. After all, Christianity, brought in by the Portuguese, started gaining popularity pretty quickly at the time. In the early 19th century, the rules around the isolation policy slowly started to loosen up a little bit though, with more and more foreign knowledge and trade making its way into Japan. When the US confidently sailed into Yokohama Bay in 1853 and basically told Japan to open up its doors already, it was clear that Sakoku was soon about to meet its demise. And so it did. With foreign visitors as well as influence now allowed in the country, Japan was about to become a global superpower, freed from its chains of feudalism and led by Emperor Meiji. The so-called Meiji Restoration equipped the land of the rising sun with a military, political parties and a parliament. With the country rapidly changing and adapting, the Yakuza were forced to do the same. On one hand, this was done by diversifying business. Gambling was still the moneymaker for the gangs, and street market business was also here to stay. However, construction work and Japan's countless docks, which were now busier than ever, were now both added to the catalog of revenue sources. The Yakuza were also looking into legitimate business as a cover for their not-so-legitimate businesses. With this newfound legitimacy came political connections, which in turn led to the gangs growing fond of a little thing called bribery. Shoving money down the throats of both police as well as government officials unavoidably brings with it close ties and relationships with these influential members of society. The Yakuza understood very early on that cooperation with them would be key to long-term success and growth. After all, if your main source of income is illegal business, you don't want the authorities sniffing around too much. So what the Yakuza needed was something to give them in exchange for freedom in their own endeavors. Luckily, they had two very valuable goods on offer. Manpower and a knack for physical violence two attributes that are perfect for breaking up unrest among laborers, which Japanese government needed a lot. Just like gambling and bribery, strike-breaking became synonymous with the Japanese crime syndicates and loyally followed them as a business well into the modern times. The turn of the 20th century rapidly approached the land of the rising sun. With government ties firmly established, it was time for the Yakuza to get deeply involved in politics themselves. Tune in next time to find out more about the influence of a man named Mitsuru Toyama, ultranationalism, and the admittedly cool-sounding Dark Ocean Society. Sayonara. <laughs>